from a dark corner of a university laboratory comes the device that reveals the mysteries of death. The Lifespan Machine. <laughs> well, I joined the lab two and a half years ago, right out of undergrad. And I was brought in to run this machine that I knew nothing about at the time called the Lifespan Machine. The Lifespan Machine is essentially a large distributed microscope that allows us to observe large populations of C. elegans simultaneously. It's a high definition time-lapse microscopy device and basically what that means is it takes images of agar plates with worms on them every hour for their entire duration of their lifespan. C. elegans are probably the simplest complex organism you can study. They're full animals. They have a pharynx, a body, uh, muscles, uh, a gut. They have all the parts uh, they might want to study an animal, um, uh, but they're very small and easy to culture. The traditional way of doing uh, lifespan experiments is that you sit down in front of a microscope and you have a population of 100 and 200 animals and every day you go through each individual and you sort of poke it with a little rod and if it moves, it's still alive. Um, and it works great, you get the experiments done, but it doesn't really scale up that well. Nematodes, like humans, spend the last period of their life not really being very mobile. Um, and so you end up uh, seeing these old worms who can really only move their head back and forth a little bit. Uh, and so the task of the lifespan machine is to detect these subtle head movements. And then when they finally stop altogether, you can call the animal deceased. And um, you, now you have the full story of their lives um, before and after you do some sort of intervention to them. The lifespan machine really starts with individual flatbed scanners. And then you retrofit them to turn them into biological experimental equipment. So you take a single scanner uh, and it fits 16 plates. And each of these 16 plates can hold, say, 50 worms. And then you can buy as many scanners as you want. <laughs> For certain nightmare weeks, I have run uh, two to three incubator experiments with as many as 15,000 worms. We were interested in the aspect of aging that produces a diversity of lifespan in the population. Why some animals have different outcomes at the end of uh, aging as others do. One experiment we did is we took animals and we grew them all up at 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, where they're all super cool and happy and relaxed. And then we took uh, another population, we put it up to 25. And another population, we put it up to 29. And we saw, as people had shown before, that the animals at the higher temperatures, they lived a lot shorter. But what we were looking at specifically is exactly how the shape of the distribution changed, whether even though they're living shorter, perhaps they were more or less variable in their lifespan between individuals. So what we saw was that the populations all exhibited uh, temporally rescaled distributions which is that the variation um, that we see in between individuals seem to be locked in proportion with the mean lifespan. Uh, the distribution of lifespan is merely being stretched or compressed uh, on the time axis. Given the complexity of the underlying biology of aging and uh, the different interventions we were looking at, I thought we would uh, have um, an intervention like a genetic change produce a very different effect on the lifespan distribution than, say, a change in diet or a change in temperature. And what we found is that all of these changes produced a very simple effect on the distribution of lifespan. I think out of these lifespan distributions uh, comes the idea that there's a central aspect of uh, aging that's sort of uh, maybe resilience or frailty. And I think the temporal scaling we see in lifespan distributions is driven uh, by this uh, resilience or frailty. I think it's very consistent with the idea that there is one aspect of an organism that determines its risk of death from all sorts of causes.